Christ's Letters. Continuation of Letter 2. We are on... I am on my day 12 of reading uh, the Christ's Letters. My mother, although furious with my seemingly big-headed attitudes, was nonetheless torn with her feelings of love and compassion for my emaciated condition. She rejected everything I appeared to stand for, rebelliousness, contempt for the Jewish religion, high-handed attitudes towards authority, my self-will and arrogance, but she, st she still loved me and was deeply afraid that I would eventually land up in greater trouble than I had ever thought possible. <clears throat> she admonished my brothers, telling them to hold their noisy arguments and turn to me. You can stay here until you are better, she said. Perhaps while you, whilst you are here, I can talk some sense into you. I can tell you now, if you go out into the streets and begin talking as you have to me, you will end up in an even worse state than ever. Good people will spit and throw their rotten rubbish over you. You are a disgrace to your family. So, despite her anger, I laughed and thanked her and kissed her warmly. Gladly, I remained with her knowing very well that underneath her anger, she was deeply anxious for me. She fed me well and made me good new clothes. I appreciated all she did towards improving my appearance, as I knew that to move freely between rich and poor, I must be acceptably clad in decent garments. At times, there were food shortages in the home. Drawing on the power of my father, I replenished them, saying nothing. Neither did she. I knew she wondered sadly whether, to all my other bad habits, I had now added that of thief. Then she caught me with a freshly baked loaf in my hands and knew that I had not been out of the house to buy it, and neither had the stove been in use that day. She said nothing but gave me a long, pondering look. I could see her attitudes change at that moment. She was no longer sure of her ground. She was beginning to question her own attitudes towards me and also the truth of my statements. What really happened to him out in the desert? How could he make a loaf of bread without fire, flour, and yeast? What does it mean? Is he the Messiah? Then my brother cut his hand. He was in much pain when it festered. He allowed me to put my hands on his wound and quietly pray. I could see that he felt the power flow into his hand because he looked at me strangely. The pain has gone, he said briefly. He was surly as he walked away, and I knew that whilst he was relieved to be free of pain, he did not like me for having been able to help him. I sensed his jealousy. My sister scalded her hand, and another brother often complained of bad headaches. I was able to cure them both. My brothers and sisters began to joke about my magic powers. They questioned what, quote unquote, what quote unquote, evil I might do to them if they angered me. The tension in the home deepened and I felt sadness for my mother who longed for peace in the house. But she saw changes in my behavior and was comforted. I was quieter, visibly controlled likely outbursts, reigned in my energy, curbed impatience, no longer argued. I became more caring, listened to her womanly grumbles, 
helped her in the house by repairing broken furniture and walked the hills to distant farms to find the fruit and vegetables she wanted. I came to love her tenderly and compassionately as a mother should be loved. One day, she ventured to ask me, Do you still say that Jehovah is a myth? Job said that if Jehovah were to withdraw his breath, all flesh would collapse together. That is the Jehovah I believe in and saw. No one has seen Jehovah, he said firmly. I saw that which has brought all things into being, I replied quietly. I call it the Father because it is perfect love. Love more perfect than a mother's, I added, smiling at her. It works in, through, and for all its creation. It is the Father in me which has brought you the things you needed in the house and healed my brothers and sisters so swiftly. I could see she was beginning to understand a little of what I said. What of sin? she asked. There is no sin as we understand it. We are born to behave as we do. We have to find a way to overcome our human thoughts and feelings for they separate us from the protection of the Father and bring us our sickness and misery. When we have learned how to overcome the self, we will enter the kingdom of heaven. My mother turned away silently, obviously pondering what I had said to her but no longer in angry. I knew she was thinking about my statements and realized they would be turning her safe and well-known world upside down. Without her belief in a Jehovah threatening dire vengeance, if mankind was unruly, she would feel lost and insecure. She would wonder how the world would ever manage it was left entirely to men to control the evil doings of themselves and others. Even kings and governors were wicked in their actions. Without Jehovah to rule and punish sinners, where would it end? Whilst regaining my strength, I studied the scriptures diligently to enable me to meet the Pharisees and scribes with confidence. It was also imperative I should know what had been written of the Messiah because I was convinced I was he of whom the prophets had spoken. I could indeed rescue, save people from misery, sickness and poverty, even restore them to health and prosperity by showing them the truth concerning the kingdom of heaven and the reality of the Father. When I felt I was sufficiently prepared to go out and teach and heal, to please my mother, I agreed to go one Sabbath to the synagogue in Nazareth and speak to the congregation. As was customary, I stood up and was handed Isaiah to read. I chose the passage prophesying a Messiah would come who would release the Jews from every type of bandage. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then I sat down, saying, Today you have seen this prophecy fulfilled in me. There was shock and amazement on the men's face, but I continued to speak, knowing that the Father would tell me what to say. The words came without hesitation. I spoke about my experience in the desert and related my vision of the baby growing into manhood, all the while, all unknowingly, wrapping himself around with mental thongs and chains, thus blinding and imprisoning himself in interior darkness and shutting himself off from God. I explained that in so doing, they exposed themselves to oppression from conquerors, slavery, poverty, and disease. For God is light, I said, and light is the substance of all visible things. 
and light is love, which makes all things for man to enjoy. All blessings of abundance and health were freely available to him who loved God with mind, heart, and soul, and lived strictly according to the laws of God. When I had finished, there was complete silence in the synagogue. I felt that the congregation had experienced something strange and powerful and had been lifted to a higher plane of thought and wanted nothing to disturb the transcendent tranquility of that moment. When the whispering started amongst themselves, then the whispering started amongst themselves. They were wondering who I was. Some were convinced that I was the person, Jesus, whose family was known in the village, but others could not accept this since I had spoken as one having authority. Unfortunately, I felt my old reactions to these religion, religious men returning. I knew that they had despised me in the past and so I expected rejection. I slipped back into my old challenging attitudes and thoroughly angered them. Through my own human reactions, I invited disaster, and disaster I almost got. The younger men, urged by their elders, rushed at me and dragged me to the highest cliff top to hurl me to my death, but I prayed to my father for deliverance. Suddenly, it seemed they were so stirred up they hardly knew what they were doing and turned on each other. I was able to slip from their midst and escape. It was strange. They seemed not to notice my going. Badly shaken by my experience, I managed to send a message to my mother saying I was leaving Nazareth immediately and was going down to Capernaum, a gracious town by the Sea of Galilee. Number three, I arrive in Capernaum. At first, I thought to join old acquaintances, but I felt intuitively this was not the right thing to do. So, all the way down and on entering the town, I prayed for the Father's direction and help in finding accommodation. I had no money and would not beg. As I walked the street, a woman of middle years came towards me, heavily laden with baskets on her arms. Her countenance was sorrowful. It seemed she had been crying. On impulse, I stopped her and asked where I might find accommodation. She said briefly that she would normally offer me a bed, but she had a very sick son at home. She added that she had been to buy, she had been to buy provisions to feed the comforters who had already gathered to mourn when her son died. My heart grieved for her, but also rejoiced. Straight away, I had been led to someone I could help. I expressed my sympathy and offered to carry her baskets to her house. She looked at me for a moment, wondering who I might be, but was apparently satisfied by my appearance and demeanor. On the way, I said that I could probably help her son. Are you a doctor? she asked. I replied that I had received no medical training, but nonetheless I could help him. On reaching her house, large and well-built of stone, Indicating social standing and prosperity, she took me to her husband, saying, This man says he can help our son. He nodded morosely but said nothing. The woman, Miriam, drew me away, saying he was distre distressed and very angry. The boy is our only son amongst many daughters, and he is blaming God for giving the child the sickness. Miriam wept. If he speaks like this against God, what other troubles will be heaped upon us? I wonder. Take comfort, I said. Shortly, your son will be well again. She looked doubtful but led me to the room in which the boy lay. It was hot and stifling and filled with gloomy, talkative well-wishers. I asked the mother to clear the room but the visitors were hesitant. They wanted to see what would be done and only left reluctantly when Miriam called her husband to speak to them. I could hear them arguing with the father in the next room.